Dr. Stephen Bramer is Chair and Professor of Bible Exposition. Stephen graduated with his THM in Old Testament from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and he got to DTS as fast as he could to do his PhD in Bible Exposition. He's the author of many books and articles, and the most notable named The Bible Reader's Joke Book, 2,000 Jokes Categorized from Genesis to Revelation. In addition to teaching at DTS, Stephen is also, also serves as teaching pastor at Waterbrook Bible Fellowship, a church his family helped plant in Wiley, Texas. He's developed a deep affection for the lands associated with the Bible, and as a result, he strongly encourages all of you to consider joining him uh, and uh, the DTS, on the DTS student tour scheduled for May, and he encourages you to attend the brown bag event after this chapel service. Stephen is forever in love with his wife of 48 years, Sharon, and she's here today, so we wanna welcome her. And uh, he's equally in love with his three kids, their spouses, and together, their 10 grandchildren. So will you help me welcome Dr. Stephen Bramer. If I were a betting man, I'd bet on bail. Now, before you leave chapel, <laughs> stand up and rebuke me or fire me. Uh, I want to uh, say to you Greek students, this is not a first-class conditional sentence that you can translate since I'm a betting man. Uh, this here, uh, neither one of these statements are true. If I were a betting man, and I'm not, I'd bet on bail, and I won't. Because we're going to take a look at 1 Kings chapter 18 to see what happens in this wonderful story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. It's probably a familiar story to many of you, especially if you grew up in Sunday school, you know this story. But I'd like to approach it and apply it to those of us who are preparing to serve the Lord and perhaps already serving the Lord. I believe that the context of this passage in Elijah's day is not too dissimilar to the context of our day. There's a pressure to conform to the majority. There's the lure of syncretism in our churches. There's a refusal to take a clear, firm stand. We're encouraged to hold a position of tolerance to various teachings, even when they're unbiblical. There's a fear of intimidation that paralyzes the believer into inaction. I've noticed among many of God's people, there's a hesitancy to go all in for God. But I'm going to suggest to you that in this passage that we will look at today, a decision to stand for and to trust God unreservedly, despite intimidation, despite the pressure to conform, will please God and will result in his blessing. If you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to open them up to 1 Kings chapter 18. Trusting God enough to confront spiritual apostasy. Chapter 18, verse 17. We're breaking right into the middle of the story. And I apologize, but as the television sometimes say, in the um, constraints of time, uh, the following sermon has been edited to fit into the next 30 minutes. So uh, here we go. We're jumping in here to chapter 18, verse 17. When Ahab saw Elijah... Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather to all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Who is this King Ahab? He's a king of the northern kingdom. He is bad. He is evil. He has, through his wife, introduced Baal worship into the northern 
kingdom. Here is what the author of 1 Kings has to say as he evaluates him in 1 Kings 16, verses 30, 33. And Ahab, son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And as if it had not been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and he went and he served Baal, and he worshipped him, and he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, his capital city. And Ahab made an Asherah, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. King Ahab had wrong theology. King Ahab was the troubler of Israel, not Elijah. It was King Ahab who had brought that judgment of terrible drought upon the land. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28 detail the various judgments that will come when they're disobedient. And drought was one of them, famine. And here for three and a half years, King Ahab has refused to repent and turn to the Lord. And for the last three and a half years, rather than repenting, he's been going after to find Elijah. In Israel, in all the surrounding nations, he's been going after him to kill him. And now Elijah summons this evil king. He's going to speak to him face to face, even though this king has been after him. Well, just who is Elijah? He's a man from Tishbe. You say, thank you. It's on the other side of of the Jordan River. He's a man from nowhere, from the other side of the tracks, or other side of the Jordan River. He appears suddenly in 1 Kings 17. We don't know anything about his family, his background, his calling to the Lord. And in 2 Kings chapter 2, he'll be taken suddenly away in chariots of fire. But in these eight chapters, we will have the ministry of this prophet of God. He's the fourth most mentioned Old Testament character in the New Testament. And these eight chapters interrupt the pattern that we have in First and Second Kings, where it's talking about the kings of the northern and southern kingdom. And they became king and who their father was and how long they reigned and who their mother was and whether they were good or evil. And in the middle of that pattern, we have an interruption. When you're reading through a genealogy and you see an interruption, you want to pay attention. When you're going through a list and you see an interruption, when you're going through a pattern and you see an interruption, you want to pay attention. And the ministry of Elijah will interrupt the pattern of the kings. He's preaching in the ninth century probably 40 or 50 years after Solomon has passed away. Uh, Perhaps uh, 80 years after the temple has been built there in Jerusalem. And Elijah's going to be the first prophet to address the breakaway northern kingdom in any extensive way. 100 years from now, Amos and Hosea will come along and address the kingdom. Elijah is going to challenge Ahab to gather the people, the prophets, the prophets of not only Baal or Baal, but also the prophets of the mother of Baal, Asherah, and he got, encourages them to gather together at Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is actually a mountain ridge. It, it is on the south side of the Jezreel Valley. When you come to Israel, we'll show it to you. And, and <laughs> It's in the central place between Phoenicia, which really had worship of Baal, and Israel and Judah in the south. It's kind of a central meeting place. And he invites the prophets of Baal uh, to come with Ahab. Uh, There's only two depictions of Baal that I can find in the archaeological record. One is a little six-inch bronze statue found at Megiddo, and it's now up in Chicago, uh, of Baal. And another is a, a 56-inch high limestone uh, stele in which there is um, uh, an imprint of Baal. He's standing there with his left hand, uh, sorry, right hand upraised with a, a club in his hand. In the left hand, he is plunging a spear like a bit of lightning into the ground. In the top of the spear, there is sprouting fertility. And that's our depiction. We have many, many literary uh, 
works uh, found up in northern Syria about Baal. He's the god of the storm. He's the god who brings fertility. His religion is a sensual, sexual religion that permits people to live really any way they desire. He's a bit of a voyeur god, and he loves to look down on his temples where the priestesses are. And people go there so they can manipulate him to give him what they want. And so Elijah invites these people to come to Mount Carmel. Ahab and the prophets, and Elijah all alone, in a winner-take-all competition. He's going to trust God when the odds are against him. Take a look at 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 29. Uh, he comes to them and he sends to them and he invites them to come. And Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel or Carmel. And Elijah came near to the people and said, how long will you go on limping between differing opinions? How long will you hesitate? How long will you just limp along, almost paralyzed, rather than making a decision? If the Lord, Yahweh is God, follow him, but if Baal, follow him. And the people didn't answer him a word. They don't want to make a decision. I think they want to see who's going to win this context, contest. I think that they're hoping that Baal will so that they can carry on living their lives any way they want and immorality and without uh, being under the law of God. I think they're hoping for Baal to win. But Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. The Baal's prophets are 450. We know that Obadiah had provided for 100 prophets of God, but they haven't shown up. We know later on, 1 Kings, that there will be 7,000 people who haven't bowed the knee to Baal, but they're not there. Uh, they love the Lord, but they haven't taken the courage to come to this contest, this competition. And there is Elijah all alone. Let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it in the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. Let's have a competition. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourself one bull and prepare it first for your many and call upon the name of your God and put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given to them and they prepared it. They called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. And they limped around, same word as before. They, they kind of jerked around, not knowing exactly what to do, maybe jumping around a little bit, the altar they had made, and at noon, Elijah mocked them. Uh, be, be careful, this is not a spiritual gift that most of us have. Um, he mocked them saying, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's musing, or he's relieving himself, or he's in a journey, perhaps he's asleep and must be wakened. And they cried aloud, and they cut themselves after the custom with swords and lances until blood gushed out on them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, the, the solemn offering down there in Jerusalem, often called the evening offering. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. See, the odds appear to be against Elijah as they start out this contest. And that's why I start off by saying, if I was a betting man and I was an Israelite back there, I might bet on Baal. Just think of the advantages. The prophets of Baal have home court advantage. They're very close to Sidon where the worship of Baal had, had really blossomed. Elijah's very far away, 60 miles or so from Jerusalem. 
There were temples of Baal close by in Phoenicia, and in fact, uh, King um, uh, uh, Ahab had, had gotten all of these uh, altars around him to Baal. Numbers advantage, 450, really 850 to one. First choice advantage, they got to go first, the prophets of Baal. And if you know anything about NFL football, you want to be the one who goes first to receive the ball in overtime. Because if they can get Baal to answer, there's no time for Elijah to respond at all. They will win. The altar, the material advantage, they probably put a new altar, at least one that was there and ready for use. Fire from Baal advantage. Baal was known to bring about fire. And here they are on Mount Carmel almost 800 feet above sea level, a tall mountain range sticking out into the Mediterranean where the storms are going to come off and there'll be lightning and rain. Baal worshippers regarded lightning and thunder as a manifestation of their deity. Passion advantage. They danced. They uh, frantically uh, hit themselves and they sang and they prophesied with volume and they went to the shedding blood. In fact, Elijah mocks them. I think the reason he mocks them is that Elijah is going to refuse to acknowledge Baal as a god at all. Perhaps he's gone off to the restroom, he says. Perhaps he's sleeping. I think he eggs them on so that later on they would never be able to say they hadn't tried hard enough. They hadn't persisted long enough. They hadn't cried out loud enough. They've got a time advantage. They start early in the morning. I don't know whether that's six o'clock, seven, eight o'clock. They're going to go to noon, three or four hours, and then they're going to go to the time of the evening sacrifice. They, they've been going for six hours or longer. Elijah's going to have an hour or two left before the sun sets. But the reality is that Baal can't hear. Baal can't see. Baal can't answer. But God can. And what you need to understand is that with God, odds don't matter, numbers don't count. Odds don't matter, numbers don't count, because God is God. And there we see that God can do the miraculous. And Elijah is going to trust God for the miraculous. He is going to bring his offering. At the time, verse 36, of the offering of the oblation, the evening offering down there in Jerusalem, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O oh Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I'm your servant and that I've done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me. That this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you've turned back their hearts. Then fire from heaven fell. See, there is Elijah trusting God for the miraculous. He takes an old altar that was broken down. We're not sure if this altar is perhaps even from the time before Solomon, before the time the temple was built, because the law was clear. When God chooses a place for his name to dwell, there's only one place you can bring sacrifices. But this was an old altar. And here is a prophet. Prophet's not supposed to offer sacrifices, only priests. Why is Elijah up there to offer it? Because I think there were no faithful priests in the northern kingdom and because this is not a sacrifice for sin. This is going to be a sacrifice to declare who God is. And the prophet is going to come along and he's going to find 12 stones. Isn't it interesting he didn't just choose 10 for the northern kingdom? He chose 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. There wasn't a different God for the northern kingdom and for the southern kingdom. He brings these 12 stones together. And then he handicaps himself. He, he takes water and he begins to pour it on the sacrifice, the altar. I think he wants them to know that he has not hidden a few live coals under the wood, 
That they'll be able to accuse him later on of somehow uh, being uh, lacking in integrity. Uh, he is going to have it soaked until the water runs around. Say, man, you shouldn't use water like that when you're in the middle of drought. Elijah knows what he's going to do. There's going to be plenty of water here in just a few hours. And he's gone to a cistern or a well or spring and he's brought up this water and he's filled the trench. And then he calls out to God. He trusts God to answer prayer. He calls out, it's not about me, God. It's about you. I'm not wanting you to answer me because then they'll know that I'm a true prophet. I want you to answer prayer that they would know that you are God. And the fire fell, verse 38, of the Lord fell, and it consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. That's some lightning strike. But it wasn't a lightning strike from the sky because there were no clouds in the sky. This was fire from heaven. God had sent fire in his glory down to the tabernacle and the temple. He had also sent fire down when unauthorized incense had been offered before him. Fire for judgment. And I think this fire fell, which was judging the northern kingdom, and it was fire fell because he was saying, the presence of God is here. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Trust in God to answer prayer. Now, Elijah had not just shown up here, and this was not his first time to trust the Lord. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. I've trusted him o'er and o'er. See, Elijah, three and a half years before, had trusted God to, to stop the rain. James says Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He, he wasn't anything special. He was like you and me, yet he prayed fervently that it wouldn't rain. And for three years and six months, it didn't rain. Then he prayed again, the heavens gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. He had learned to trust God. He had learned to hear and trust the word of God. Chapter 17, verse 2, the word of the Lord came to him. Chapter 17, verse 8, the word of the Lord came to him. Chapter 17, verse 24, the word of the Lord is in your mouth. He had learned and heard to hear the voice of God, the word of God. And he responded. He had experienced God in providing for him. God had sent him across the Jordan River. Ravens had fed him meat. I would just love to be one of those uh, Israelite women who uh, cook something and put it in the table or put some bread there on the windowsill and they come back and it's gone. Where did that go? Some raven came along and took it and there's Elijah eating well. And then the river dries up. Isn't it wonderful when God comes through for you? But sometimes God then ends that way of providing for you. And we get so used to God just being, uh, acting in a certain way. And God is just the God of the impossible. He's the God of the surprises. He's the God of the unusual. And he says, I don't want you to be fed here anymore, uh, having water here. I want you to go up to Phoenicia. I'm saying, God, I think you got the place wrong. That's where Baal worship is. He said, I want you to go up there. And I want you to go to a widow of Zarephath. And, and Elijah was able to experience God's miraculous provision. Oil that didn't run out. Flour that didn't run out. Isn't it wonderful when God comes through and then the son of the widow dies. Has no breath in him. And Elijah learned that God could miraculously provide even resurrection from the dead. Now he's going to die again, so I, my good friend Charles Savell says this is like resurrection. Resuscita uh, resuscitation and resurrection. He resuscitates him and he resurrects him, but he's going to die again. He experienced resurrection. And now he is ready to trust God in front of 850 prophets and the king who wants to kill him. This morning, I want to challenge you. 
I want to challenge you to take a stand for and trust God unreservedly. Despite the, the pressure, the intimidation that will come with it, I want you to stand for the Lord. Make that decision. Because it will please the Lord and he will bring blessing in his way and in his time. It probably will not be fire from heaven. But God miraculously can provide. I've got a life, uh, this November I've known the Lord for 66 years. I've got some wonderful stories about God providing. And I've learned from all of that to trust the Lord. And I want you here at DTS to learn to trust him so that when that time comes where God may ask you to stand up publicly against all that's going on, you'll have learned to trust him or and or. I hope that some of you don't have enough money for tuition. Now, don't walk out again. <laughs> but you see, when we have everything, it's really easy to trust, but we don't really trust. And sometimes when we don't have, that's when we learn to trust. I hope some of you struggle in some of your classes, because I did, and I want you to... No! <laughs> you learn to trust God. Some of you will go through some difficulties in your marriage. When Sharon and I were here doing our PhD, I went and saw a counselor here at DTS. I needed help, and so might you. And you will discover that God can help us in our relationships. He can help us in our marriage. He can help us. And as you learn to trust him, you will discover that when God calls you, you're prepared. Trust him now. Trust him in the everyday moments of life. Trust him in your family. Trust him in your education. Trust him in your church. Trust him when you're listening to that podcast or, or viewing that film. Trust him and say, God, I will stand for you. I will reject that which is not in keeping with your word. I will reject those people who are compromising. I'm going to challenge them. So this day, this day, are you hesitating between two opinions? Are you trying to make sure that you don't have to take a firm stand that everybody will somehow love you? Or are you willing to trust God? Are you assuming that God can only work with good odds? <laughs> You're going to plant a church and you want to make sure that you've got really good odds to uh, plant that church. Sometimes God just says, odds don't matter. Numbers don't count. What you determine to be success and what you determine you need is not what I'm determining. Are you going to trust the God who does the impossible? Are you responding with faith to the odds in your life right now? I've learned to trust him. God's been good to me. God, help me to trust you more. Help me to trust you more. I'm turning 70 years of age next week. And I hope that, oh no, don't cheer for that one. <laughs> I'm hoping that I will trust Jesus more in my 71st year than in my 70th year. Because we're never there. We've always got room to grow. And if you stop growing, you're in trouble. Don't think that you'll learn everything here at DTS. You're just getting started. You may know a whole pile of stuff up here, but you're going to learn that that stuff is going to come down to your heart and in through your life. And I hope that years from now, when you come back to DTS, you may have even forgotten some of your Greek. Sorry, guys. But, <laughs> but I, have, I hope you've never forgotten the Lord Jesus Christ, who has saved you from your sin and has given you truth that you can teach truth. Yes, we want to love well, but we want to teach truth. Truth, today, will you commit yourself to boldly follow the Lord? God may not choose you to publicly confront the syncretism and ungodliness in our society. He's going to use some of you to do that. But he wants all of you to stand firm. I don't know what's going to happen in our world. I'm looking around and I'm beginning to suspect some things are coming against the church. 
But I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I work for a non-profit. And I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going to come. But if you take a look at this world, God needs a few of you who are going to stand up and say, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. This is true. And there is no God beside him. Never to end, I've never ended a sermon early, but I'm going to today. Praise God. Uh, <laughs> it's going to make me feel really good. But before we end, I'm going to pray. And I would like to ask you that if you've never made a commitment to serve the Lord totally, all in, unreservedly, to be willing to stand against any sort of pressure, that you make that decision today. And if you've made that decision, that you reaffirm that decision, you can do that just as we bow our heads. Some of you may want to raise your hand. Sometimes a physical action is wonderful to say, Lord, I'm committing myself to you. You can use me any way you want, at any time you want. I am willing to stand up for you. And some of you may even want to stand up. I'm standing here today, but I'm not just standing here at this moment to pray. I'm standing saying, Lord, I want to stand with you. I want to stand for truth. And I'm prepared, Lord, to give whatever it takes to be true to you. Do you want to do that? Let's pray. Father, for those of us who are standing, for those of us who have raised our hands, for those of us just deep in our heart, saying, Lord, you're God. You've been good to me. You've answered my prayer over and over. Now, God, I just want to make sure that I'm completely committed to you, that I'm all in. And so, Father, I pray that you would work in each one of our hearts, that you would find us faithful, faithful to the end. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us Thank you, Spirit, for being within us and giving us that power. Thank you, Lord, for being the one true God. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.